Yes. Plus us, I guess. Yeah. You'd think this would function as the list. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> oh well. Participants, now it's your turn. I, I only know how to count by three, so I'm going to ask for hands and I'm going to give you numbers. Uh, and then I'll call on you by number and we'll do it three at, uh, three at a time. Uh, and then we'll do it on another set of three. Uh, please, when you speak, uh, if you aren't too shy about it, I know this is Canada, but uh, give us your full name before you ask your question or make your observation. And uh, I forgot to say earlier, but any of you who bought your lunch, thank you very much. We encourage you to uh, come, when you come to City Conversations, to bring your lunch, to eat it quietly, and, uh, and enjoy. We know that people have a limited time here. So with that, number one, so I'll hand up there. Number two, and number three, okay, heavy hitters. My name is Bob Ransford. I think um, Frances had a really insightful comment when she said, we don't know how many times the planners say no. And I think the measure of a really good planner is to be able to articulate in a reasoned way or a, a rationale for saying no. And I think the kind of planner that we need in Vancouver right now is someone who has a vision for what to say no to and a reason to say no. I think in the last few years, we've been saying no to a lot of things as a reaction to what we're hearing from neighborhoods that have never had to experience change before. Um, it was very easy for uh, Larry Beasley and Anne McAfee because they were seeing a transformation in Vancouver at a time when we were developing brownfield sites and port-related sites at the edge of the city where there were no residential neighborhoods or the downtown south area where most of the residences had long left those neighborhoods and they were transforming areas that would bring people into the city when people wanted to see a rebirth of the city and there was no one feeling threatened by that. We've run out of that kind of land now and we've seen the continued same um, pace of growth and we've seen we've experienced growth in waves in Vancouver since the 1880s and those waves come every 15 or 20 years and we're in another one now and we need a planner that actually can articulate a vision and it's not based on design but it's based on how we manage growth it's based on where we're going to put growth in the city and be able to say no because i don't think <coughs> honestly you don't know how many times planners say no even under the existing policies that we have not changing policies but vancouver has a very unique system and that all of the planning decisions are discretionary basically there's many conditional uses in most of the zones and there's a lot of discretion that's delegated. If you go to, for instance, Delta or Richmond and places like that, they, the council even is involved in approving development permits. It's not delegated to staff or to the development permit panel or something like that. So uh, Vancouver is a unique situation. We need a planner who can say no and explain why they're saying no, and that will tell us what yes means. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is David Gregg, and my question relates to the advice given to the Director of Planning. Um, that Director would receive advice from the Planning Commission and also from the Advisory Urban Design Panel. So on both of these um, significant influential bodies of um, advisory bodies, the terms of reference would need to be reviewed, in my opinion. The reason for that is in the Vancouver uh, Planning Commission, there's not even a requirement for one single professional person to be on that panel. So I stand corrected, but none of them need be an architect, a planner, or an engineer. So with the advisory design panel, there's not even a planner on the panel. There's someone from the Urban uh, Development Institute, uh, architects, landscape architects, engineers, but not one professional planner. So my question back to any of you that may wish to comment is, do you think that the Director of planner, uh, Planning should review those terms of reference of those influential bodies, or that should be left to the Council? If I could start and just uh, question your basic premise that, that, that the Planning Director takes direction from those two bodies. I think the Planning Director is over the, 
what's the planning design? What's it called? The design urban design, design panel. panel. Urban design panel. Uh, it isn't doesn't the planning director sit on that panel? No, no, no that's not the one. Sorry. No, that's um, the uh, development, development permit. Thank you. Um, certainly, the planning commission. I was on. I've been on the planning commission. Was originally the planning body for the city before they had a planning department. But now, with all due respect to people, current president has on the planning commission. It's kind of uh, a group of people looking for a purpose. I mean, they don't really have a, a legislative function, and they, they jump in as need be as they, as they try to get ahead and around the planning processes in the city, but nobody has to listen to them. They're yeah. advisory bodies, yeah. and the city planning commission is expected to represent citizens, not planners, and they, they collect whatever information they can from uh, anybody that's interested really and say this is what we think as interested citizens and the planning director doesn't isn't order follow it in fact with the advice that you're supposed to be the council and it's not intended to be a professional body and it certainly has no real authority over the director of planning yeah and in about all 20 years of covering council i can't think of a single time when the planning commission has had any direct impact. I mean, maybe just because of the people who are on it and they're, not, oh, well, this. I signed up for the yeah. Zero. yeah, and the urban design panel, I don't think, uh, like, there is, if, if the director or council wanted to, they could overrule the urban design panel, but I think there's a real reluctance to, so there's a bit of a moral authority there or something, like, I don't, I can't think of a time when the director of planning or council approved a project until the urban design panel had approved it. Now, you know, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about certain pressures that were both brought to bear in certain projects, and we won't name them here, will we? Uh, but, um, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think council and the director are very sensitive to, uh, you know, how bad it would look if they went against uh, a vote uh, in the negative at the urban design panel. But the question is... Should there be a planner on it? No. Oh. Well, the main question is, should the director of planning review those terms of reference to affect... But I don't balance? think the director of planning has any authority to do that. It would have to be council. My guess would be the director of planning has got enough people coming at him or her that adding one more would just be... I think you're void that they probably want to. Okay, number three. Um, back in the 50s, Roland Bart wrote about the book called Mythologies, which is the stories we tell ourselves. It's on the desk of every planet. Exactly. City Hall. There's a mythology that's grown up in the city about the importance, role, and power of city planners, and I'd like to really seriously contest it. This is this, uh, one of at least three full board sessions devoted to the search for the new planet. Planners have a role here like movie stars do in LA or philanthropists and bankers do in New York. And I do think we need to question this as part of this. To respect this process, we have to question it. I think we had one truly visionary planner in Ray Paxman. We had a superb communicator in Larry Beasley. Uh, we have a landscape now where I don't think, what, no matter what the CV, I don't think we can have the kind of success um, equal to the, to the expectation. I think we should be instead having a talk about how we've developed a city that has a developer's party to the right and a developer's party to the left. Why, we, uh, why the city has, you know, Francis and Jeff and Handel, full others, but a very, very passive media environment uh, where things go in question. I've been to Toronto, Tel Aviv, and Edmonton and see more debate about decisions, etc. I think we're missing the boat. The search for the super planner is a fool's game. Yeah. Now, having said that, uh, my vote. <laughs> Jennifer Kiesbach in Toronto is getting murdered from the mayor at one side and getting murdered by her own staff on the other. I think she'd be as close to perfection as I could cope up. So, I'm not, so just, <laughs> <laughs> well, what is your yeah. answer? <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Yes. Well, you didn't do it. Is there a special? That's great. I mean, it's true. It's true that the planner has as much leeway as council and the city manager give that planner. And I know Larry used to get reined in from time to time. Um, 
you know, can you just stop blabbing so much in public? Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, you know, it does depend uh, very much on the, the, the environment that they're working in. Um, but I, I mean, I see the, the focus on the planner as part of the huge interest that Vancouver has in design and planning. This is the only city, I think, where you get 600 people out on a June evening to listen to Andres Duaney talk about, you know, the ecosystems of suburbanism versus urbanism. Like, I can't think of another city where that many people would show up. There's just a huge interest, and yeah, and part of that is investing a bit too much magical power in the, in the Well, I guess my point is that we should try to get the story right. In other words, question mythology. And, for example, Jim Shank's role in the development of Vancouver's Tower of Podium pushed aside and politicians and planners to take credit for it. Well, I think history will of the truth eventually, but I think we, we have bought into a mythology that is hard on the planners who to get that job. I've Their actually creation. read recently a completely revisionist thing that it was Richard Henriquez who laid the groundwork okay. for Jim yeah. Chang. That's but not that's, you know, that's... It's actually been fun. Four, five, and six, please. Oh, there Before they are. Four, on. five, and six. Before you go on, can we please, following your uh, initial outline, we have the name of uh, yes. number three. The Trevor Boney, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Trevor. Thank you. And Michael, and Marguerite just had a good point. Yeah, Could you repeat your question? Again. You're talking about what things look like, not how they work. I mean, Vancouver works, and I always have. What happens as we change it, somebody needs to know. And I, I think that a director of planning can. Certainly Ray understood how cities work. And that was a very important factor. I mean, Vancouver works. It may not always work. We've got 50% of the population living on the 30th story. Will we have the same city? We don't know. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't know. And the, and the current something. The council undoubtedly doesn't know, but we need to understand before we actually do it. Yeah. So, um, number four. Uh, number four. Yeah. Frank yes. Ducote, uh, former Your urban name? designer. Frank Ducote, form, former urban designer in the city and also member of the planning commission at the time. Uh, Francis had a, an interesting point: Is there a need for a new city plan? Um, city plan came along before we had regional context statements. And theoretically, the regional context statements for all municipalities in the region say how much of the population, how much of the jobs you're going to take in your share of the, uh, of the larger region. Um, because city plan preceded the regional context statement, it seemed to be there was a real opportunity, had they been reversed, to say, okay, we have this growth potential here, jobs and, and, and units and people. But we don't know how to allocate those things. We're going to send planners forward in the neighborhoods and do a plan, and it'll be driven by capacity analysis. It'll be driven by vacant sites or whatever, underutilized sites. I did one in Oak Ridge Lane there back in the day, and Francis remembers that in the mid 90s. Um, but we never said to a neighborhood, your share of the regional context to take X thousands of people in the city over the next 20 years is why? Right. Except Grandview Woodlands. They got the I'm number. going to speak to that. <laughs> and maybe they were told that. I don't know. <coughs> and question, if you were told that in Dunbar or the West Side or West Point or something, it is based on the amenities capacity that you might have, future, present and future transit, uh, job, uh, excuse me, school seats, any number of factors you want to say into a capacity. It's, they're not all the same. You don't get 1 20th of the, of the growth but you get your share of the growth, whatever that is, based on factors. We never told people that. And so they were able to say no to us because they didn't want to take You mean in, 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 in the, the city, city plan, plan or in the, in the city plan, plan process, right. they were essentially able to say no. Mm -hmm. We want a hell of a lot of amenities, but we want nothing more than four stories. So um, I think that missing piece about your share, and then the question becomes how. You take it in townhouses, anyway houses, or whatever else. I don't know if mm -hmm. what the former councillors or Francis you think about that. I that thought there were some numbers Which is sort of a vision for the plan. whole city, but yeah. not necessarily a city plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's a good point. Uh, and I think 
some of the angst about development in the in the region, yes, comes because we're going through a wave of growth mixed in with some other factors that make people anxious. But also I do think it's the regional growth strategy that had specific numbers and then allocated specific specific numbers to municipalities, some of them argued for more. <laughs> um, that has propelled some of the resistance. Is you know, people sort of accepted growth when it was just happening, but suddenly when they feel like there's a quota, I feel like there's more resistance. Uh, I, I would beg to differ with that because mm -hmm. I think you said earlier, just lay down the rules and we'll work within them. And mm -hmm. I think if people knew this is what we have to do, very difficult discussion to have, you know, because who decides which neighborhood gets what? They won't be the neighborhoods because they get to decide how they fit them in. Or maybe they would have, but well, we'll take a lot of them. We're not disagreeing. I totally agree with that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but but people, if, it, if, if it's inevitable, people will ultimately accept it. They may resist at the beginning, but people understand. I mean, if all kinds of areas of Vancouver have now accepted main houses. The first main house created a riot. I mean, people didn't get the idea. They didn't think it was important. And they sweet, so it was the same and, thing. And, 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 when, when our council approved a small wedge of land in Point Grey, the, the land was stratted, the houses were single family, and I voted for it. I got hell from the Northwest Point Grey Homeowners Association, because that was a pure RS1. Mm -hmm. It had to be sick. Well, that wouldn't happen now. I mean, they've accepted the basement suites and yeah. main houses. And but Frank's point about if we said Vancouver's, a, you know, agreed that growth inevitably is going to bring this many people, here's Vancouver's part of it, and here's how we're going to allocate it in the neighborhoods, here's the rationale for how we're going to allocate it, uh, and then it's going to be up to neighborhoods at different points to say how, how are we going to accommodate that. But yeah, only some neighborhoods have heard the, num the magic number and others haven't. Yeah. But it takes time, people have to take time to adjust yeah. to the idea. I just want to quote from City Planning about on this, on this thing. Even with growth, that's the, that's the acknowledgement we have to grow. Vancouver will keep much of what gives its neighborhoods their look and feel. Trees and greenery, heritage buildings, distinctive area identities, generally low-scale buildings outside the central area. So that's right, and it was constantly called up whenever we came to some project we come up neighborhood. Well, look, we already agreed on city plan. We're, we're going to keep it the way it is. We'll give or take a few Granville Island type amenities. Number five, please. Thank you. My name is Dorothy Barkley, and I'm the chair of the Grand New Woodlands Area Council. I sat on the Citizens' Assembly, and I'm co-chair of the Coalition of Vancouver Neighborhoods. We've been focused on what's been going on for so long, and Francis, I disagree completely. Within the Citizens' Assembly, everyone was crying out for context. How do we fit into the city? How do what are the other neighborhoods doing? What's the rationale for what needs to happen? We couldn't even get a number as to what the densification was. There was just this underlying theme that you needed to take densification, whatever that may be. Generally, it involved a lot of height. And with regards to UDP, I would urge that there should be someone, it could be an architect, it could be a landscape architect, whatever, there should always be someone from the neighborhood because UDP, when they look at what's going on in these neighborhoods, it's an academic process that does not touch on them or their lives or their neighborhoods. Um, I haven't seen it happen. <coughs> so I would suggest that if I could ask for anything from the new city platter, we recognize there's a role for the development community <coughs> for the city and its goals, but the residents need to be consulted and there needs to be a city plan, a comprehensive plan that explains why we need to take how much growth and how it's to be apportioned and not to leave the residents out there and just floundering. Well, this gets to Patrick Condon's point mm -hmm. uh, that Vancouver is the only city in the region without an, offic uh, an official community plan. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Are we that special and different that we can't come up with one? Everybody else has one. And then the rules are laid out and we know there will be growth here and density here and so on. And we don't have all these developer-driven initiatives to throw all the neighborhoods <coughs> into a tailspin because where did this come from? Some development proposal dropped out of the sky or headed into the sky, and now we've all got to adapt to it. Number six, please. Who was number six? Okay, we're going to call for a new number six. <laughs>
Number six. Okay, great. Adrian Carr, City Councilor. Um, and by the way, I was a graduate student of Walter Hardwick when he was a uh, uh, City Councilor. <coughs> and I heard endlessly from him complaints about staff, that this was a council with lots of vision and staff had too much power. So in this last election, I think um, that planning did become political. And what we heard from citizens is the concern that staff had too much power, council had too much power, developers had too much power, but the citizens didn't. So how would you, in thinking about a new planner, chief planning for the city, how would you frame the need to focus on giving the people some piece of that power that they are obviously desiring? And how does the planner, chief of planning, actually balance that, the direction of the department, with the will of council on that issue? With the will of council or the yeah, will of with the, the people in the neighborhood? I uh, know that I'm saying if they are appealing to the people, how do how do they how does how do the planners deal with council and whatever council wants in terms of public participation? If it's different from what if it's different want. from from what the people want or the plan or the the people want or the planner himself or herself. There's no science to this. It, you, you've almost got to make it up for each project you have different issues that raise, arouse different parts of different neighborhoods and different levels of emotion. And but I think the thing is that you've got to be willing to do that. You've got, and you've got to give them a chance. As a matter of fact, we mentioned Mary Beasley. Mary Beasley was a phenomenally good local area planner when she was young, big yes, beginning. We had a huge committee in Middle Mountain that ranged from Grace, Grace McCarthy's constituency president to the local uh, Marxist Leninist candidate, and everybody came, and everybody had a say, and it went on for ages. But, uh, but <coughs> in the end, it transformed that community. It, it really made a huge difference, but it took a long time, and it took Larry knowing how to keep these people going and to hear what they had to say. It went on for quite a while. I don't think you can hurry it if you're actually trying to hear what people say. Perhaps they could go to Granby Woodlands and the Citizens Assembly and say, what have we learned? Because that's been a very long, painful, and deeply thought out process. There and must be some lessons out of that. I mean, I, and I have to say, my concern is after covering more awful public hearings than I care to mention, more than you ever went to. <laughs> <laughs> Just because he was only on for a certain number of years, I mean, not not that he wasn't at all. <laughs> um, but uh, there are so many people in this city we do not hear from. So, what does it mean when you say you're listening? Does it mean you listen to the people who come to council and <coughs> start screaming, or is it other people who maybe never come to council? You know, there were a lot of people who crapped all over um, the city's STIR rental program. Uh, those buildings are now filled with very grateful people who get a chance to rent a new apartment instead of a basement suite, um, you know, near transit and so on. Uh, uh, and uh, they never showed up at any meetings. They're just happy they have, like, a, uh, there, there's so much rental now, or not so much, but, you know, at least a little bit more rental available in Vancouver that, than used to be. So uh, that is my concern about the whole public listening part. Who are you listening to? Well, that actually raises a question that I've been asking for about a year now, which is when we have public participation, the people who come are the people who are already here. Who speaks for the people who want to be here but aren't here yet and therefore don't have the voice? Or or even because they can't afford the housing price. You know, some whether yeah. whether it's because they can't afford the housing price, or whether 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 uh, like with rental housing simply isn't available. Yeah. Who speaks for them in these plans? Okay, we're, um, I throw that out as a rhetorical question. Uh, hands, please, for number seven. Put up. hand up there for number seven and eight. And sorry, and Andy, Andy's got his hand up. Just be bashful. Uh, Andy, eight, sorry, uh, and number nine. 
Okay. Number seven, please. Okay. And your so name? first of all, on the rental, um, it would your be name, the city when they're making your name, decisions. Your name, please. Gardner. Thank you. Uh, when the city is making decisions, they actually have statistics and information in front of them. Over 35% of condo buildings, stratas, are rental. They don't include that in stock. So they're giving away density, they're giving away all kinds of things to build rentals when they're already there. So, I mean, you got to have all the facts when you're making decisions. Second thing is, uh, we went through in the Mount Pleasant plan, we spent five years developing a Mount Pleasant plan. There was density that had to be taken. We looked at options. We got to a point where you, we were told the only way you can do it is put in towers. We went out, brought the community together, did a charrette, and proved that we could take all of the density without building anything over four stories. That was completely ignored by the city and by plan. So, if you're going to get a new plan, you know, one of the frustrating things when you look at, Vancouver Sun had a big article on the current planner saying his city. It's not his city, it's our city. So we need a planner who's going to listen to the community. So, just on that, I do agree about the Mount Pleasant plan. It's also one of the reasons that I'm not so crazy about developing a city plan. They spent three or four years developing the Mount Pleasant plan. And the very first building that was proposed, everyone started arguing and saying this isn't what the plan was about. So I'm not convinced that a plan is going to solve problems. But one of the problems there is that, and I said it when the plan came out, yeah. Basically, it wasn't worth the paper it's written on. None of, the, none, of the, none of the community plans are, because the city has so many diverse policies that they can come along and say, oh, this is STIR 100. Oh, no, that plan doesn't apply here. We're going to put this spot rezoning in that spot and ignore the plan. And they've done that over and over again. So you need a city plan. You need to understand how it's going to work. You need to know what. If a neighborhood plan you spent three years on didn't work, how is the city plan going to work? The only reason it didn't work is because it came along and overrode the plan. They overrode the plan. Okay. If they had stuck by the plan, there wouldn't have been a problem. Did council accept? Did council pass the plan, or was it? Yes, and then they ignored it. Isn't that no, what happened in Grandview Woodlands? Pardon me. Isn't that what happened in Grandview Woodlands? No, there's no plan yet. Yeah. Well, that was, they have, they have that was the making of the plan. But, but anyway, there's... the problem with the Mount Pleasant plan is when it was passed, all the residents were like, yeah, this is great, we really like it. And then the minute the first building came along, people started to disagree about what uh, actually the consensus had been. And I think there was legitimate confusion on the part of residents who said, wait a minute, Yes, we said we'll take some density. We didn't say a 26-story tower exactly. at Kingsway and Broadway. Just on your rental point, though, I think you're, if I can respectfully say, I think you're a little bit wrong there. CMHC does now look at the rentals in condos that is factored in uh, when the city is looking at how much rental is available in the city. Well, I've been at public hearings at the city. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We get to we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Sorry, number eight, please. I guess, I guess that's me. I'm Andy Yan. I'm, I'm, I'm an urban planner as well as a member of the City Planning Commission. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave it fairly simple, is that perhaps um, there's a line that um, the, the Titanic was built by professionals, the Ark was built by amateurs. So that I'm, I'm curious that in your, I mean, in, in your discussion of who the next planner would be, that it's been, I think the general regional context plan comes into how, the, and by 2040, Vancouver is supposed to grow by 120,000 people. That How would you see that 120,000 people who aren't here to show up to a public meeting, who aren't here to advocate, should be allocated? You mean among the neighborhoods? Yeah. I want to go back to Patrick Condon. Didn't he work that all out for the whole region? Yeah, we can yeah. put them all down these corridors and <laughs> fit them all in. We don't have to have that many big towers or whatever it was. Yeah, There's one that's if every single landowner on an arterial agrees to redevelop. Ask Dunbar whether they're going to put those. Oh, that, that's the next phase of the discussion, of course. <laughs> you know, 
Like it's just like people saying, oh, there's all this zone capacity in Vancouver. We don't need to rezone anything. Well, you just you don't have to be here very long to understand that no matter what the zoning is, not every owner is going to build to the max. I could tear down my heritage house and build a duplex. I'm not going to do it. So you know, and many small owners on on arterials are not interested in redeveloping for whatever reason. A lot of them can be persuaded by developers if they have no other options. Maybe we should start charging for people leaving buildings empty. Mm. Yes. Well, that's <laughs> Has anybody got an actual count of how many there are? Empty what? The last empty, empty buildings? The last I heard was 14. Well, there's no data. There's no data. Okay. Anyway, but um, I, 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 whoever it was who said it, um, someone was talking about if you're going to allocate it, you can't just sort of go by the square kilometers or whatever. You have to look at the amenities in the area and allocate it that way, which, who was saying that? Was it you? Or? Frank said, oh, Frank, yeah. Uh, and what about listening to the communities? Maybe some say, yeah, we're happy with it. I want to age in place. I need it someplace nearby. And others say, no way. And, Maybe there could be some happy compromise. Maybe. Yeah. I, it certainly can't be just by, you know, square kilometer or something like that. I just want to throw another thing that hasn't been said yet about uh, neighborhood participation and people speaking and citizens' engagement. Now, half, more than half the people in the city do not have English as their first language. They are not comfortable talking in public meetings. Their voices are very hard to be heard. And uh, somehow the new planner has to get them into the picture, too. Mm -hmm. okay. On that note, we have to stop because it's 1.30. First of all, I want to thank our uh, presenters. And we have uh, some uh, little gifts for you. Uh, let's give them all a... Uh,